Well, good evening and thanks for joining us tonight here on News 20 on Primetime Sports and GTN. I'm Randy Gardner. Joining me to my right, we have Coach G. Glad you could join us. We talked before we went on the air. About eight years you've been coming on the show. Yes. Wow. It's been great. It's the time flies. Well, time does fly. Yeah. And to your right, we have Sheldon Webster, the head coach over at McClure North for the ladies' track program. Glad you could join us also. Thank you. Got some interesting questions I'd like to ask you sure. personally about my training, and I'm sure everybody out there with summer here, they are trying to hit the streets, doing some running and getting in shape. Coach, what, what's your word of advice to whether you're a novice or an expert about training in this type of weather right now? If you're out here in this weather, plenty of water. You want to at least drink a gallon or so a day. Not just saying, just put it in front of you, but as you go on to your regular activities at work and then before practice, getting plenty of H2O in you so you'll be hydrated. So you want to get out there because this heat, Missouri heat, is very funny on the body. You're even seeing in the World Cup right now where they're taking water breaks. Actually, there was one game where they took a water break. About 40, 40 minutes into the game, they stopped and let both teams get some water. So you know that that hydration does play a big part. Yeah, in, the Brazil, um, Brazilian weather, yes. All right, Coach, I'm going to start off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, um, you know, after 20 years, I'm going to be selfish and ask a, a question of my, my own. I've been running um, two, two to three miles a day but I can't get past that hump. I hit the three mile mark and I just, I can't go any farther. Mm -hmm. What should I be doing? Uh, how many days a week are you running? Every day. Every day? Uh, do you have any goals, objectives? Goals? Other than to yeah. go fast, farther than uh, that. Not to die. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, really I, I, I'm trying to train for a triathlon. Okay. Uh, you know, a mini one to do the swimming and the running. Mm -hmm. And I've ran my whole life, but you know how it is on off on right off. Oh, yeah. now i'm back yeah. on right. and i'm either all on or all off yeah, it's a it's an exercise in momentum you gotta if you get too much time off it's hard to start over again um not knowing any particulars about the way you train one of the mistakes that people make is they do the same thing day in and day out in other words i'm going to go out the door i'm going to run two two and a half three miles um i'd mix it up i'd uh I'd stick to your two or three mile run a couple days a week, but one day a week I'd do something shorter and faster in little pieces. One day a week I'd slow down and I would set a goal of going five or eight minutes further after I hit my three mile mark. I'd mix it up. I'd get a little more variety in there. Um, variety will make it a little more interesting. Variety will wake up some muscle groups that maybe you're not using. And those slightly longer runs will simply get you more confident. Uh, it's it's simply, a, a, simply an issue of your mind knowing that your body can go that far. Your mind says quit a long time before your body needs to quit. Now most people watching tonight are, you know, in my situation, you know, just the, the casual athlete right now later in their, in their stages of life and just doing it to try to keep in shape. Um, I had heard that the walk a little bit and then run and then walk and then run faster and walk so kind of an interval type thing burns fat faster and is better for your heart if you do that rather than one two or three mile just steady pace run correct or bogus um there's a, there's a lot of credibility behind that i can't necessarily speak to the physiological impact of it but I know that there are some training schools that have been out there for a few years now like a guy Jeff Galloway from down in Atlanta wants his athletes to combine running and walking um, run for four or five minutes or eight minutes or whatever walk for one or two uh, your your running segments are actually faster uh, your heart does not have that opportunity to to let the heartbeat come way down to recover um, and if you're a casual athlete if you're looking to finish something uh, even if you're looking to, to maybe set a PR of sorts, depending what they are, there is a lot of credibility behind the run-walk uh, routine. Um, a lot of people doing it, a lot of people recommending it. I'm, I'm pretty hardcore for a long, long time. It was, you know, walking was a sign of weakness. Uh, I incorporated that, and I recover better. I'm in my mid-50s now, so I, I recover better doing that. Um, but I think for the casual athlete, there is a lot to be said for using that walk-run ratio. You're out there longer your running segments can be a little bit faster um, and sometimes people just need the chance to walk and smell the roses and not worry about surviving. So I do most of my running now on on the treadmill knees mm -hmm. from soccer my whole mm -hmm. life bad ankles so uh, the treadmill I get on there you know walk 30 seconds 
run at five for two minutes, walk 30 seconds, run at six for two minutes, work my way all the way up to nine, and then work my way back down, and then back up, back mm -hmm. down. So our heart's all over the place. Mm -hmm. So just, I, I, just that would you do, know, I thought I'd throw that out there. Well, you know, doing this, again, you mix it up. Do something like that once a week. Uh, do can, the, the steady run a couple times a week. Don't be afraid to mix it up. Don't be afraid to mix it up. Coach has always been trying to get me to get faster through my days. Believe it or not, back in my high school and college soccer days, that was pretty quick. But now, you know, 25 years later, I've lost a lot. Can you get quicker? Yeah, you can. As you get older? Yes, I'm going to piggyback on Coach Webster. Contracts work out. Because your body can get stale and you get bored. You want to challenge yourself. You want to shock yourself. Yes, you can get faster and quicker reps. Like with the track team, we do, we do a lot of drills. We do a lot of speed drill. Everything coming in the sprint is how fast and how quick and the power step, call a power step, how fast your steps get down. You, if you're going here, in a decent round, you're going, pow, 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 pow. you know, you're getting that speed, everything, mechanics and your form and everything together. It's how fast and quick you get that step down and keeping your stride open and keeping the frequent turnover, how Ooh, fast I'll you get tell you, down. I come, I come from a distance background. Mm -hmm. Anybody that knows me, I come, you know, coaching cross country, and, and uh, I uh, coach a gal who's been uh, to the Olympic trials marathon, and another has been to the Olympic trials steeplechase, so on and so forth. And the one thing that I have learned now in working with sprinters for so long is even with middle distance and distance people, even people who prefer to go just, you need to incorporate some kind of quickness, some yes. kind of speed. Mm -hmm. It improves coordination, it improves uh, physiological efficiency, it's going to make you more comfortable at higher speeds. Uh, it's just another tool in the arsenal that's going to make it easier for you to do a variety of things. And piggyback on coach, that last 150, say you got that half mile, the, t the, t the half milers, there, it's, it's, it's a sprint, it's a technical sprint. So whoever comes out of that curve, that one last 150, usually win, and they go into a speed mode. You can look at uh, a, a young man like uh, CJ, CJ Jones, uh, the Cardinal Ritter. That's what he do, he gets up there and he just open it up. And that sprint mode coming in with his middle distance and his distance running, and now he incorporate that speed training. That's how, he, that's how he breaks away from the pack a whole lot of times. So once again, to jump back, you know, for the average person out there training who's watching, I, I have a lot of problems, and I, I know a lot of other people have the shin splints, mm -hmm. problems like that. Is that just a wrong, wrong form of running, getting on your heels instead of down on your toes, and um, stuff, or is that a shoe problem? There, it's it could be a variety of things. Um, with again, not knowing. Uh, a lot of details about uh, about your training or your shoes or so forth. Number one, you're talking about muscular weakness, and so if you're mechanically inefficient, if you're if you're hammering the ground, if your hips are down instead of up, if you're a plotter, um, there's a lot of coming through that shin. You might have problems. Uh, you could have an Achilles uh, or a calf issue in terms of it not being flexible enough. A lot of times, stretches in the back of the. Uh, the back of the calf and the Achilles will help fix it. And sometimes it could be a shoe problem because if you don't have enough arch, if you're pronating in, you're rolling in, you're putting extra stress on the inside of that muscle. And that's what a shin splint is. The muscle basically is being pulled away from the bone. Mm -hmm. uh, so mechanical efficiency is always going to benefit you. Uh, running on soft surfaces at least half the time is going to benefit you. Treadmill's not too bad. Um, and you want to be careful of incline. If you're suffering from shin splints, you don't want to be climbing a lot of hills. You don't want to get your treadmill at too, too much of an incline. And go see a shoe expert and see. Maybe you're wearing a, uh, maybe you're wearing a neutral shoe and what you need is some kind of stability shoe that deals with that rolling in. So there's a variety of things that could be causing it. So many things to think about here. And we've talked about this, Coach, through the years about uh, getting started and how people will get started. They'll be gung-ho for you know, a couple of weeks and then they fall off because it's too hard or they start having shin splints. Uh, should you check with the, you know, with the doctor first and really figure out, like you were saying, all these little technical things that might help you or solve some problems down the line that will keep you in the game longer? Yeah, you, you do. I sometimes, I like, when I went and I had some foot problems, I went to, went to, uh, first I went to, uh, uh, they have some experts in there, you know, uh, gentlemen and uh, athletes that former runners are still running, and they put you in the proper shoe, and that's a pretty good shoe. Sometimes other shoe brands um, might look good, might feel good walking and stuff, but it, like Coach said, is this a proper shoe 
for your feet. Okay, some people have different, you know, uh, dynamics and whatnot. And then as we get to a chronic part, you you know, you go to a foot specialist, and they can they test and everything. They might get you some some inserts uh, to go in your shoes because sometimes we have students we deal with at our school, McClure North, are flat footed, and we teach them, you know, hey, get a tennis ball, roll it, or something round that's kind of hard or flex foot and roll it, so you can build that arch up. And, uh, and running flat foot is just like trying to be a sprinter running on a flat tire. That's going to cause a lot of problems. But this can go all the way back to maybe mechanics from the waist up. Absolutely. Right Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's just, we talk to kids a lot about, I need you to run with your entire body. So many people run with half a they run with half their body. The upper body doesn't do anything. I'll be I'll be driving along the streets and I'll see people jogging and they're and I'll say to my wife, "Go, oh, I could help her. I could help him. I could just because there's nothing going on up yeah, here. They're stiff. just hanging yeah, here just and the hips are sitting down and yeah. they're plodding. Um, you have to generate force from the lower body, the upper body, uh, on different planes, forward, backwards. People like gravity dictate everything. Um, the legs are going to do what the arms tell them to do. Coach talked earlier about stride frequency and force and some that's got to come from the upper body. Um, and back to your issue in terms of, you know, how when they're starting out, I think a lot of that depends on age. If you're my age, if you're mid-50s and you're starting out, I think you do, you know, you need to talk to your doctor. If you're a young guy with no, no health issues, I don't think that's, necess that's not necessarily something you need to do unless you have a family history of something. But you always start, the most important investment are the shoes. So you go to one of these experts, be it new whatever mm -hmm. the case, and they're going to put you on treadmills, they're going to talk to you about things, they're going to figure these things out. So no matter what your age is, if you're going to start out, I'd see a shoe expert and I'd make sure that you get squared away from the bottom on up because almost everything starts at the feet. Uh, even if you're not doing something right up here, the problem is going to enter your body down at your feet because that's where all the force is coming up through the ground. Mm -hmm. How much um, correlates back to breathing the right way? Can you breathe wrong when you run? Yeah, a lot of like we have our we get our kids all the time. They they run with not breathing, and they say I'm going faster. Actually, you're not. You're gonna decelerate or you're gonna hit a wall. You have to breathe real good. Breathe slowly. Some people uh, mouth and nose at a rhythm. Okay, taking it in and taking it out. And so yeah, we teach breathing technique because some people they. They just, they don't breathe right. You find a lot of, lot of kids, we are, particularly late in the workout, they're going to try to grab their oxygen from the chest on up. In other words, they're breathing from the chest on up, and they wonder why they begin to hyperventilate. Mm -hmm. Coach, I can't get enough oxygen. I can't breathe. I said, no, you need to. I said, you know, I said, watch a, watch a baby sleeping. I said, it's, it's talking about breathe from the belly button. You should see that belly button rise. You should see the lower part of the lungs, the diaphragm area mm -hmm. is filling before the upper part. They're just trying to fill the top half of their lungs. And so oftentimes we'll go through exercises, just lay down, relax, put a book on your stomach, and just practice getting the feel. The book needs to rise before the chest. How do we mislearn that as we get older to breathe, you know, you're born, you breathe that way, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you start breathing a different way? Is it something that's a learning um, response or? I, I don't. I don't really know. I would, I would have to say there probably is some kind of learn response element to it since you can train yourself to be aware of it. Um, you can reprogram your neurological system. You can be conscious of it. Um, I would say there has to be some kind of learned uh, response to it. Uh, a lot of people, when they get stitches, they, they, that cramp underneath the ribs, which medical science still can't tell you exactly why that happens, they're trying to grab from up here. And you battle those things by breathing from here. You, you kind of push the belly button out, you let the lower lungs fill up before the top. And if you can control your breathing, not only can it get more oxygen, be more efficient, but you can avoid a lot of that. Uh, some of it is lack of fitness, but a lot of it is just really poor breathing techniques that for some reason or another, we people tend to adopt. So right. you were talking about that that, that pain mm -hmm. there. So it's it's a lockup. It's called it's like like you 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 call it a stir, stitch. Lock up. You, yeah, it's, it's a stitch. almost it's always lock. right underneath the right rib cage. Yeah. And is it, that when you're working out, or is that all afterwards? And it's usually it's going to occur somewhere during the workout. During the workout. And it's a matter of. Uh, um, kind of adjusting your breathing. I found when I'm running, if I'm having an issue with a stitch or a cramp, 
it makes me war more aware of my belly breathing. I can fight it off. It doesn't cause it to disappear, but I can deal with it. I can fight it off. I can limit the damage of it. Um, and so again, it's, it's amazing how many fundamental things we have to sit down and teach kids that you know it's it's different than running on the playground there there's there's physics involved there's psychology involved there are all kinds of things that they need to learn and they just it, I mean, they've never done it before let's say you hear all about the 5k races you hear about the half marathons you hear about the marathons if i came to you and said i'm 46 i want to run a marathon next year possible or impossible first thing i'd ask you is why <laughs> yeah. um, is, is, is it is it is it the next step in a goal for you or is it just you know getting on the getting on the marathon bandwagon to say I've done one um, but I would ask you a series of questions first thing I would ask you is you know what are you doing now what kind of training are you doing now what kind of shape are you in now uh, and you say you're running two to three miles a day every day I mean I, I could make probably if I had to, you know, five or six. Sure. But um, I don't even, I don't think I could get But we need to, you know, you say next year, I'd say, okay, which one do you have in mind? Because whenever you're dealing with fit, physical fitness and working towards a goal, we do this with our kids as we work to the state meet, is you start at the target date and you go backwards. So in other words, here's my goal, let's work backwards. Let me see how much time I have, what steps do I need to incorporate? And then you can begin to prioritize. The more time you have, the more different things you can do. Um, and so I would find, okay, what are you used to doing? What's the longest run that you've done? What kind of racing have you done? Uh, how much time in a day are you willing to devote to training? Yes. Do you have any goal for that marathon? Some people say, well, I just want to finish. Other people will say, well, I want to run under four hours. I want or under three and a half hours, whatever the case may be. I'd factor all those things in and then I would sit down and I would begin to map something out. Is it possible for you to be running two to three miles a day now and complete a marathon, finish a marathon next year? And by next year, let's say a fall marathon, so basically we have 12 months. Absolutely. Um, then it comes down to how fast you want to go, what do you want to get out of it, so on and so forth. But sure, if you if you've got a base of fitness, twelve months is more than enough time. Uh, what I shy away from are the things you see in magazines. You know, run your run your uh, run your best half marathon on three months work, or, or run your best marathon on on running three days a week. All those shortcut things really kind of trip my trigger. They uh, I'm not a shortcut kind of guy. I'm a long term guy. So. And coach, is that the way you? Uh work with the kids in terms of setting a goal here's the here's where you want to be and here's how we're going to get there right same thing coach be on that same page you always look where your data and we go back what have you done you interview the kid anytime i'm working with someone i interview what is your goal how much time are you willing to put in you know are you you know we talk about diet we talk about sleep habits we talk about just regular day activities mm -hmm. same thing we do with our high schoolers we had to put in place they're in school so many hours okay then we say what are the we got to put in fact what might happen at home what do we get the most out of our kids at our at McClure North with the track teams lifestyle Girl, variables are right, a huge right. issue when you're when you're training not just training anybody but mm -hmm. high school kids a lot of the ones we deal with mm -hmm. lifestyle issues because I'll tell you what is anything even if it's final exams whatever they're bringing to the table is going to impact prom. them out of the <laughs> oh. prom oh. homecoming oh, uh, had a fight with my boyfriend fight birthday with my parties fight or with, yes. babysitting uh, yeah uh, it's uh, uh, their siblings and you know running errands you know and we have to put them and sit down here's a goal you have to manage your time with us because we, if we want to win a state champion which the girls team did they had to make sacrifice and the sacrifice paid off with the manager you know I got to do this with everything that outside of track and field now not in this next segment here not to, not to name any brands or food or restaurants or anything like that but when you look at health and nutrition wrapped up into this whole aspect of um, becoming more fit, losing weight, doing everything the most of the general public is trying to do right now. How important is that diet aspect or health healthy eating aspect along with the exercise itself? Well, it's huge because it's uh, basically at its at its most fundamental, food is a fuel. Um, and the better the fuel you put in, uh, the better the engine's gonna run. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's eating the right things, it's doing it at the right time. For instance, the body is most ready 
to rebuild muscle and take in electrolytes and things like that within an hour after workout. So we talk to kids, this is when you need to do it and this is what you need to eat the night before and this is how you need to stay refueled throughout a meet. Uh, it's huge. Um, it's a variable that as adults a lot of times we can control. As kids they can't always control it. You have to eat what's in the house. Um, it's a it's a huge variable and probably we get in if there's any area where we get into a lot of bad habits it's eating you know we have the sweet tooth we have what's convenient so on and so forth uh, it's an important variable but it requires a lot of discipline it requires a lot of planning um, as adults you get into a lifestyle where if you're not planning and fixing foods up on the weekend you're going to do what's easy during the week um, it's, a, it's a huge huge variable now I've got three little kids so you know where my eating habits uh, are. I tell you what, without my, naming my, names, my wife, exactly where my wife and I both work, and and there are just times when it's Dumb you know food. this is easy, this is this is quick. Uh, boy, I got a taste for this, and it's been a hard day, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of a lot of reasons that we have where we let ourselves out from under things. And it's not to say that they're not valid. It just goes to show you how hard it is um, for some of some folks to reach the level that they do because you really, really have to, I won't say deny yourself things, but you really have to prioritize and plan and be absolutely focused on the goal or it's easy to get off the train. Coach, when, um, when would you advise for the parents out there who are watching who might have a, a child who they feel might be gifted in that that world of sports or track when do you really start looking technically and professionally at getting you know a trainer or really pushing them in that direction of not just the rec sport well i uh, i train uh young most of them sometimes they're middle schools and i train them different from my high schoolers because you want you don't want to push them because are they physically or mentally ready to to go to that next level so I talk to I get down I sit down with the parents and I sit down with the students because most time they know what they want and uh, I always look at it like this you have your recreational athletes your development athletes and then you have your competitors in which what we have in our summer track program or any type of sports program so first thing you interview because they're smart enough to know what they want to do and you find out what what they like and dislike, and I train them differently. I wouldn't put uh, um, um, a 9, 10, 11 year old in a speed jacket right now, and you know, because of their physical thing. I want to kind of like get them a, you know, step, a step, just like high school athletes. You don't want to give them too much, especially in the weight room. You want their college coach to, to have some fun with the kids and the kids to look, go to another step so they won't get bored with it. So it's important that you interview and look at the physical aspect and also the mental maturity aspect of a, diff, of a student athlete. Remember the time you had me pulling down the tire mm -hmm. down the track? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've got some great footage from the early early days when I was in my 30s. Um, can you train too much? Absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I get into this mode, I'm either on the bus all the way or I'm off the track that's all the a, way. And a, I, I'll, I'll run for two or three months every day mm -hmm. and then I'll stop and then I'm off. I've, I can understand that. I've been my own worst enemy for years and years and years. If a little bit is good, a lot is better. Uh, who reads directions on the back of an aspirin <laughs> bottle anyway? Um, so yeah, you can, you can do too much. Uh, if there's one thing that I have learned in the last 10, 12, 15 years, G and I were talking about it out in the lobby, uh, is the importance of rest finding a balance and not just physical rest a lot of people don't take into account depending on how much you're training and what you're training for and who you're training with there's a there's a real degree of psychological intensity that can go along with training and uh, there are days you know you're going for those two or three months there are days you don't want to get out the door you're thrashing yourself to get out the door how much mental energy are you using to get out the door get moving so on and so forth um, instead of people building in breaks building in rest realizing that it's a cumulative process uh, we, we get in a hurry we we become impatient and if there's one of the things that I have learned, particularly with high school kids, I told G, I said, if you look at my, my training logs from track 10, 12 years ago, you'd never see the number of days off or half days that you see now because people, it, it, I can be pretty intense, kids can be pretty intense, life can be pretty intense. Um, there, you're dealing with weather, psychologically that's difficult. You're dealing with a lot of other things and physically, 
and intellectually, psychologically, you get worn down. Um, you can overtrain. You can overtrain to the point where physically you cannot recover um, without just taking time completely off, and you get to the point where psychologically you have trouble recovering, you don't make good decisions, the strategies that you usually use to get through a long run or tough workout, they're not there anymore. Uh, so I think we undervalue rest. It does come down to a mental game, I think. What helps me right now is with the World Cup on, is that I run on that treadmill and I remember my days of my, high my school thing and college is a soccer. Tour and yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, I'm out yeah, there football, yeah. and I'm part, almost part of the game watching mm -hmm. it yeah. on TV. It pushes me to run more. Yeah. So if I'm ever going to hit the five, six, 10 mile mark, mm -hmm. it's going to be during watching it, a game. Right. right. To right. piggyback on coach is right. We had a long winter this year. And it was some days we out there, you know what? I'm sick or tired of this cold weather. And we'll go inside because coach, we go to that mental thing too, because we're dealing with the weather. We're dealing with how we're gonna manage the kids with everything that we have to do. And then we had this bad weather. And we was on some, we worked out on some cold Saturday. And it took a lot of physically and mentally to get to those practice. We cold, the kids say, I'm cold. We're cold standing here watching you guys. So it goes on the coaching staff and the kids so it's been some time during the year we just sent them home we just go home exactly or cut the practice short we just have a, you have a tendency you know, again we talked about this a little bit um, as, as we become more and more familiar with one another as coaches um, it seems that a lot of the world whether it is uh, school district administrators or anybody, you try to they try to solve a problem by doing more put on more layers work harder do more and a lot of times it, when it comes to training issues the problem can best be served by doing less uh, that the woman I trained who ran the Olympic trials marathon my primary job was simply to just keep reminding her it's okay to take a day off now and then it's okay to to cut a run short it's okay because it's a cumulative process and we tend to forget that whatever that goal is and we talk a lot about how many moments we have in a season this is one moment focus on this moment and then there'll be other moments focus on this opportunity there'll be other opportunities and it all comes together it's about patience and we tend to be a very impatient society that tends to grab on to shortcuts and uh, the idea that more is better and all that stuff um, and uh, experiences told me that that is not the case. Coach, about one minute left here today on the show. Um, how important is running and track and what you two individuals do, not only to the world of track and field, but to soccer, football, baseball? Uh, athletes at all those sports can learn from what you guys teach. Yeah, they can. They, uh, you want to be a student of, of your, of your, your skill set. Every sport you have, you have to know, first of all, your mindset, you know, setting your goals and your objectives, going with those, and also being able to learn from a coach, you know, being humble, and then also putting yourself in the situation, managing your time, knowing what your limitations is. It's all right to be, to be an ordinary person. When you start thinking that, you know, you're a superstar and listen to all the things, you got to say, where am I at at this particular time? And so it's important to just, you know, being a real round student athlete, thinking your limitation, what you can do and improve on. Sounds good. Coach, we appreciate your time. Once again, Coach G from Genesis Learning Sports Academy and uh, Sheldon Webster, the head coach over at McClure North for the ladies uh, track team. Thanks so much. Very informational and educational. Appreciate the time. I'm sure everybody else uh, learned a few things today about what they can do with their, uh, their workout programs. Guys, thanks so much. Thank you for joining us tonight here on News 20 on GTN. We'll see you tomorrow night. Have a great evening. Every one of us knows someone who has been affected by cancer. More than one and a half million Americans will be diagnosed with cancer this year alone. Each one of them faces new challenges and decisions. I'm Patrick Dempsey, and I know firsthand how dealing with cancer can impact someone's life. My mother is a two-time ovarian cancer survivor. Our entire family rallied together to support her. One person alone does not beat cancer. That is why I support Breakaway from Cancer an initiative created to raise awareness about free services and programs for people affected by cancer. Breakaway from Cancer supports the services of two nonprofit organizations, the Wellness Community and the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, making support, education, and hope available to everyone. 
These organizations promote quality care and help those touched by cancer take an active role in their recovery and get them the tools they need to live well with and beyond the disease. Don't go through this alone. Visit BreakawayFromCancer.com and connect to a variety of free services and programs.